Another gift that I have this morning is introducing a dear friend. Some of you uh, need no introduction this morning, but for others, it really is just an opportunity for me to thank him. Rich Richardson is the senior pastor of Sovereign Grace Church of Gilbert, Arizona, right outside of Phoenix. Uh, Rich has been a friend for decades now, and it is a joy to say that it's a joy to have friends and partners in ministry that can last over the decades. And he is also a very uniquely responsible for the planting of this church. Uh, when the idea first came to plant Redemption Hill, Rich was the lead pastor of our team in Phoenix, where I served as a staff member. And whenever the topic of church planting comes up uh, in ministry, uh, it's a happy thing because you want to fulfill God's calling in the New Testament, but it's also a painful thing because you labor to build relationship and connection. Even on a pastoral team, you invest in people uh, with great sacrifice over the years as Rich invested in me. And then you, you become aware of the possibility of all of that investment being used for somebody else, <laughs> being sent away, uh, never to be seen or experienced personally. It'd be a bit like uh, laboring diligently on some piece of craftsmanship and then just giving it uh, far, far away, thousands of miles away where you, you don't get to benefit from it again. And, and that's, that's what it's like planting a church, like taking a little piece of your heart out and, and sending it out to bless someone else. And yet Rich's willingness and faith to plant this church and to encourage and lead not only the team, but the other leaders in the church towards the planting of this church, towards the vision of sacrificing for the sake of the broader kingdom of God, uh, not merely desiring to build some uh, kingdom uh, <laughs> of his own or of the church there alone. I, I am so indebted for that faith. We are all indebted for the faith of this church. And I look forward to the day where we will be able to echo that faith one day where God raises up someone to go out from us. And maybe even some of us, some of you, pray about going with them. That'll be a day of sending our heart away. Well, we have a legacy that Rich, in a particular way, has given to us as a church. And I'm grateful for that. But I am also grateful for Rich's faithfulness as a friend and as a preacher. As a friend, Rich was uniquely the man perhaps most responsible for me having a job in ministry. Uh, we were rem reminiscing last night about the, the choice that he made to bring me on staff and to allow me to enter into ministry. I remember being young, very confident, very eager, um, very sure of myself, a young intern, and Rich very patiently was able to work with me to help me grow in ministry, position me in different categories in the church. Very, very grateful. And so humble in his friendship that he was eager for me to participate with him. Uh, in the staff of that church. And we've just been friends through all of the joys and difficulties of years of ministry. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that friendship that it remains to this day. He's also a man who I believe fulfills Paul's charge to Timothy in chapter 2, verse 15, 1 Timothy. Do your best, Paul says, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Rich has been preaching weekly now for uh, 17 years, and it is a joy to commend you as one who has no need to be ashamed because you have rightly handled the word of truth, and I am grateful for your example. And I also want to thank and honor his wife, Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany is here, and uh, they're right over here, Rich and Tiffany. Um, Tiffany uh, has served for all of those 17 years, uh, giving up her husband on Saturday nights uh, very late and watching him labor in the difficulty of preaching and leading a team and sending out team members and having to build up new ones. And she has stood by his side faithfully. Uh, my wife and I have, have often said over the years, we're not sure we know anybody uh, that is more able to handle difficult circumstances than Tiffany Richardson. She exudes a peace and a trust in God. And it really is a privilege to have you here as well. So if we could just take a moment uh, before Rich preaches, and uh, we need to thank him and really the church that he's here representing uh, for the building of this church. We are indebted. We didn't come out of nothing. Uh, we came out of sacrifice. So if we can just thank Rich and Tiffany for their service to us.
Um, one other uh, small point I, I'd like to make um, before Rich comes up, and, and that is what Rich does uh, today. He's not only the lead pastor of that church, Rich also serves as the director of global missions <laughs> uh, for our family of churches. So if he doesn't have enough to do uh, locally and sending out church planters, he also leads all of our family of churches in coordinating our efforts uh, to serve the advance of the gospel around the world. Uh, so quite literally, he is involved in many countries from Mexico to the Philippines. He is serving pastors. He is delegating uh, other workers to go in the right uh, locations. He is coordinating budgets. I mean, th this man really oversees a massive amount of global initiative. And when, we were, when I was thinking about uh, this Sunday morning, I wanted us to celebrate God's faithfulness in the past uh, because it's appropriate to give glory to the Lord, but I also wanted us to anticipate his grace into the future. And one of those callings that we have as we look forward is our involvement in the advancement of the gospel in this region, in this country, around the world. And we are privileged to do that in partnership with men like Rich and the leadership team that we trust, that love the same gospel that we do, that preach the same gospel that we do, and that are going to serve global pastors in the same way that we would want to, encouraging them in the faith. So very, very privileged to trust the men that you are sending uh, around the world. And this is one of those men. So, Rich, we want to know, it is, it is our honor to partner with you, to support you, and to really receive the benefit of hearing from you this morning about all that God is doing now, all that he will be doing in the future. So let's welcome Rich as he comes up to preach to us. Google Maps says... I'm on? Okay. Google Maps says I'm a thousand miles from my house, but as I sing here with you and talk to many of you, I don't feel that far from home. Um, I feel like in many ways you are an extension of us because we serve the same Savior, we worship from the same, we worship the same Savior, we read the same Bible, um, and I bring you greetings from people a thousand miles away, there's a church in Gilbert, Arizona that's going to meet later this morning, and they would want me to tell you how much of a blessing you are to them. And they would want me to extend the warmest of greetings. Um, it's hard for me to believe, standing up here now in 2018, that five years ago, from a different stage in a different city, we were able to send people that we did not want to see go, go. We did not want to send the Feldners and the Stellics and the Mixers and the Paynes and the Wallies and the Tongs. We wanted them to stay, but they went. And here, we, we are, I get to be here and celebrate the fifth anniversary of Redemption Hill. And so as I stand here and as I look at you, I see the goodness and the mercy and the power of God does me great, it does my heart great just to be able to look out and see so many faces I don't know. And John, it does my soul so good just to know you and Aaron and Bart, you guys are caring for these folks. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, these people, I know they know it, but these people are blessed uniquely by God to be led by you, and you Aaron, and Bart as well. Oh, this is a wonderful, wonderful church. If you are a guest and this is your first time here, get to know the people around you. Make this place home. You will not regret it. Revelation 19, we're going to look at this morning. John asked me, on behalf of the team, to describe and look into how this church, Redemption Hill, is connected to global missions at large around the world in sovereign grace. So that's what I'm going to seek to do. And one of the ways we're going to do that is we're going to look into the future. We're going to gaze into a picture that every person who's here that's a Christian, every person will be in this picture that we're about to see. We're going to look and we're going to hear, and we're going to take note this morning. Revelation 19, verse 16, says,
says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him glory. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, that's John, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. <coughs> Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, we ask for your help. We recognize that information is not nearly enough. We don't just need to learn this morning, we need you to speak to us. There are a lot of books in this world, but only one book contains your word. And that sitting on our laps, Lord, I pray that you would, I pray that you would speak authoritatively to us this morning. Holy Spirit, by your power, I pray that you would touch each of us this morning. I pray that you would transform this room from a cafeteria in Round Rock, Texas, to become an outpost of heaven for a few brief moments so that we could gain perspective about what we're doing here and where we're going. That no preacher can accomplish, but that we can ask of you, and we do. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. In Revelation 19, that's going to be a day. That's the day that all creation will explode with a mighty voice that will echo throughout all the universe. That great multitude of which we will be numbered will be gathered before the great almighty one. And with one voice, we will cry out, hallelujah, for the Lord God almighty reigns. He reigns now, but then on that day, we will see him and we will say it from experience. And we will say it with greater conviction than we can today because we will see him and we will be with all the saints, not just of this age, but of every age. And at long last, the redeemed will be gathered in one place with one mind, calling out with one voice before the one God. After millennia, this thundering throng will emphatically rejoice that the wait is over. Mankind will be with God forever, and God will be forever with man. That is going to be quite the day. And there's no better way to inaugurate that day into, there's no other be better way to inaugurate eternity but by having a party. That's what is going to go on, a party not just for the ages but one that surpasses every age. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb, the banquet of the Lamb. That day, the drama of redemption will be definitively and decisively concluded, and the drama of glorification will begin. There will be no more tears. There will be no more sadness. There will be no more trouble. There will be no more worries. There will be no more sin, no more disappointment, no more discouragement, no more temptation, only unbridled, indescribable joy. On the day that we stand together and shout, Hallelujah, for the Lord God our, our, our mighty reigns, we will have to push out no temptations. We will have no worries binding, our, binding, binding their, their, their presence on our hearts. There will be nothing but unbridled, indescribable joy. That's what we look forward to. That is our destiny. That day is coming. And it's a day closer today than it was yesterday. What a day that will be. Two things I can tell you for sure about that day. First, that day is not today. You should still plan to come to the picnic. <laughs> Second, I can tell you decisively that many who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb have not yet heard. 
There are many invitations yet to be delivered. They need to hear. They don't know. The date for the party is set, but there are many who have not yet received their invitations. There's a world of people who think the best party they've ever been to was last night or back in high school, and they know nothing of this wonderful joy that w awaits in the marriage supper of the Lamb. It falls to us to deliver invitations to our neighbors and to the nations. We have invitations to deliver. You see, when I think of evangelism in general and global missions specifically, I want us to realize that there are many invitations for all of us to deliver. And look at Revelation 19. We find that there are many invitations that are gladly accepted. There's a great multitude who cries out here, and every one of these individuals will have had someone say, let me tell you about Jesus. And so, as I understand it this morning, we're going to speak to how. How are we in sovereign grace? with the tool of evangelism and global missions in particular, to deliver these invitations, how are you, as Redemption Hill Church in Mount Rock, Texas, connected to this thundering throng in Revelation chapter 19? That is the question. Now, if I were to interact with many of you, if I were to come to the, par to the, the, the picnic, how I wish I could, I would guarantee that there would be many of you who want to talk about how we could reach the nations, how we could reach Texas. I've been asked that many times and many places, but one thing I'm grateful for is that no one has ever asked why. And I would imagine if you're here in a Christian, you're not asking, why do we need to worry about reaching the nations? Why do we need to worry about reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ to my neighbors? The neighbors who think the best thing about Sundays is football. No one here is asking, why do we need to reach the nations with the good news of Jesus Christ? No one asks why we're trying to reach the nation. No, that's our legacy. That's a legacy of sovereign grace. You'll notice in the songs we sing about Jesus and what he's done. We sing about what Jesus and he's going to do. We, as you come week to week, you hear about how powerful and trustworthy Jesus is and how it makes complete and total sense to trust him with your whole heart. In Sovereign Grace, we have that kind of gospel heritage, which means we have a desire for the message of Jesus Christ to take root in and grow in the soils of our lives and the soils of others, other people all around the world. That heritage doesn't just happen, but it's a heritage that has been wrestled into our hearts and it's one that we must keep wrestling into our hearts. It's one that your pastors seek to wrestle into your hearts on a weekly basis. And that's not something I take for granted, nor is that something you should take for granted. How much better to ask how are we going to reach than why? How much better? Your, ask, your pastors don't ask why, they ask how. Don't take that for granted. There's a world full of people that go someplace on Sunday called church that don't care to reach the lost. This church, Redemption Hill, is not like that. This church wants that old, old story of Jesus Christ and the cherished story of our Savior. We want others to cherish that story. I'm grateful for your heart. I'm grateful for the fact that you care about reaching the lost. You stand fast in Christ and hold fast to Christ and stand hard fast against unbelievers who don't know Christ. Because you love Jesus and his gospel, you, are, you have heart to see him and his message spread. You, you are eager to give toward mission work and that just doesn't happen and I'm grateful. So how are we, we, as Redemption Hill Church, we as Sovereign Grace Churches at large, how are we to get word of this grand invitation out to our neighborhood and nations? How are we to pass them out? Four ways. How we are to get the invitations out. One way, way number one is this. Keep missiology and ecclesiology united. Now, that's a fancy way of saying keep missions and the local church together. 
a robust understanding of missiology, of evangelism, and sturdy ecclesiology, or the primary place of, for the Christian in the local church, are united in the pages of Scripture. So we want to keep them united in sovereign grace. The local church and evangelism, the local church in mission and missions go together. Especially as Americans, we can be tempted to think in the local church, our job is just to come and to sing, to go to small group and be accountable, to read our Bibles and pray. But then the work of evangelism and missions, we send that out somewhere else for other people to do, but that is not the case. The local church and evangelism and mission go together. They are best friends. Local church and missions are best friends. They live on the same cul-de-sac. They're best friends. They text each other all the time. They go to the express games when they're in town. They carpool together. Their kids are on the same soccer team. They borrow tools from each other. They help each other rake leaves in their yard. They work on their cars. They double date with their wives. The church and the mission are united. And may they be united in this church as well. Mission isn't a healthy mission if it does not spring from a local church. And the church isn't a healthy church if missions and evangelism does not burst forth from it. They go together. They go together. So the first thing we ought to do as we think about how to get the invitations out is not think, think in terms of this church, not some other organization. A low view of the local church will impair missions, just as a low view of missions will impair our local churches. What God has brought together, let no man or woman put asunder. We want to build our churches on the gospel. We're weaving into the DNA of who we are a heart for the lost. And as we strike out to work to ch plant churches, we're about making disciples and planting churches, not merely gathering converts. Conversions to Christ without commitment to the church is deadly and unbiblical. You see, we in Sovereign Grace, we rely on, no, really depend on healthy local churches raising up church planters and church planting teams. And you know what? The local church here, in the, the common, ordinary, day-to-day -day life, here, the local church is the proving ground for evangelism and mission. We need church planters and church, church team members to be able to understand what normal church is like. It's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking, if I move to another place with a group of people to plant a church, or if I go be a missionary somewhere else, once I get off the plane or unload the U-Haul, all of a sudden I'm going to be the kind of person who evangelizes. Maybe not. We ought to ask ourselves, are we evangelizing here? Our churches are our proving grounds for our church planters and our church plant teams. Think about it this way. We will fail in global missions and church planting if we have people who don't know how to respond biblically to being sinned against. We'll fail. We'll fail if we don't have people who don't understand how to weep with those who weep. We'll fail if we don't understand that it takes continual encouragement to face to, 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 for others in the face of failure. We will fail in evangelism and mission if we don't know how to help the weak or challenge the idle. We'll fail if we don't recognize that it's important and pivotal for our lives just to come on Sunday morning regularly. We'll fail if we don't recognize how to use our gifts, not to draw attention to ourselves, but to the Lord. We'll fail if we don't know how to serve in secret. We'll fail if we don't know how to pray for it instead of talking about people. We'll fail if we, if we don't know how to work like crazy for people and, not, and have them not think too highly of ourselves. We'll fail in evangelism and global missions if we, if we don't learn to gossip, and if, we, if we learn not to gossip and slander, especially when we're sinned against. We'll fail if we don't recognize how to cover evil with good or how to bless and not curse or how to forgive the unworthy or how to give mercy to the ungrateful or how to give sacrificially or even just going to small groups. You see, when you go to small groups, it's more than just a meeting on your calendar. 
you're impacting the lives of other people and other people are impacting your life. And something's happening that's bigger than you, what you can see. If our church plant teams don't have these normal kind of church experiences, missions will fail in sovereign grace. You don't need some kind of high octane experience to plant a church. You need a local church experience. You see, the reason we could commend the people that left our church on April 23rd, 2013, is because they were members of our church. And they knew what it was to be in the trenches of local, everyday church life. The seemingly mundane matters. Global missions does not require a different kind of experience that's not, a, that's not here. You don't have to go find it. It's here. Wherever there are people, you're set. Wherever there are people who are going to sin against you, guess what? You're set. When you work to build your church, you're working, maybe even in seed form, but you're working for global missions because your church, Redemption Hill, is both the fruit of Christian mission and the instrument of Christian mission. You're both the fruit and the means of mission. So how can we keep church and evangelism, how can we keep ecclesiology and missions united? How can we make sure that they remain best friends? Here's some ideas. We can raise up and send our best, not merely our willing. There are many who are willing to go in the mission field, but unwilling to be involved in local church. Those people should stay home. We can't afford merely to send the willing, but our best. We ought to, as John said, pray for church planters. Years before a candidate or a place is ready, we want to be talking about the fact that we're going to at one point send somebody to another place. And just like your leaders tell you about church plants going on, going on around the world, one day from this church there will be another church that's birthed. Another thing is that you can think about church activities in terms of mission. New small groups are opportunities to have a mini church plant experience. Nobody wants to break up a small group where you have deep friendships. But it's an opportunity to view small group through the lens of mission. You can give yourself to this church. How do you keep local church and missions on the same page as best friends in your life? Give yourself to the people of this church. Refuse to be offended and leave. Stay a long time. Pray for the lost. Pray for the lost in your community and around the world. Pray. Pray. And as we pray, we will deliver more invitations when missiology, when evangelism and mission and the local church are best friends and united. So we want to keep local church and missions as best friends. That's the first strategy to deliver these invitations. Secondly, these overlap, but we want to keep planting churches. We want to keep planting churches. Our goal is not merely to gain converts, but to plant churches. And there is a massive difference. If you do not understand that difference, stick around here, here and you'll understand it at some point in the future. The best method, the biblical method to reach the world is by planting churches. That's what we believe to be the biblical model. This has been our strategy for years in Sovereign Grace and it will be continue to be our strategy for years. Whether we're looking to go to Sao Paulo, Brazil or San Luis Obispo, California, whether we're looking to go to Kalamazoo or Kathmandu, we want to keep planting churches. And one day, at some point in the future, you will have a group of people that you do not want to see go, leave from here to go and start another church. It's going to take sacrifice. Now, I'll tell you this in advance. You're not going to feel ready. It involves risk, but it's worth it. I remember vividly April 23rd, 2013. That was the day 
that your church was born. That was the day in Gilbert, Arizona, a thousand miles from here, your church was born. And I said this to the church gathered on that Sunday. I said this in part. I said, years from now, I'm talking decades, you will be able to say that I was there. You will be able to have a first-hand, front-row view of a miracle. You're about to witness a bona fide heavenly marvel. It's not too much to say that you are about to win witness a sensation, a phenomenon of epic proportions. You are about to witness the birth of a church. More sensational than the birth of a star, we have the birth of a church. New life will explode from this room that will rattle the very gates of hell. Redemption Hill will be born. Make no mistake, both heaven and hell take notice of what's going on here today. It doesn't get much more significant than starting new churches. This is Jesus' plan to reach the world. The darkness is pushed back one lampstand at a time. You see, a church uniquely holds forth the light of the glory of Jesus Christ and his gospel, and a new one starts today. I'm saying that we are establishing churches that is special. We earnestly desire to be able to do our part to reach a spiritually dead world. And I want you to see and be able to appreciate the seismic spiritual activity going on here. As glorious as the church plant business is, it's also gut-wrenchingly difficult because we called 23 people up and we prayed for them and we sent them off. It's a bit less difficult now as I stand here and look at all of you. I can go back and say, remember five years ago when we sent away those families to go from us to go meet people that we're never gonna really be good friends with probably and start a church. I've been there and I've seen it, and the sacrifice is worth it. How do we, how are you connected to global missions? How do we keep impacting the world for the gospel? Keep planting churches. Keep planting churches. Pray that your church one day will be able to plant a church. Texas has a lot of churches but less and less Christians. There's a message that needs to go out. Even here. What might you do? How might you specifically sacrifice for the furtherance of the gospel? Pray that the Lord would raise up not just a church planter, but a people to go with a church planter. Pray that one day you will experience what it's like to send people away you don't want to go to meet other people that you don't know so that a church, the most significant thing that can be built on this planet, so that a church can be born in another area. So how are we connected? We're connected when we keep the church and mission united we're connected when we recognize that we ought to keep planting local churches. Keep planting local churches. The third way we're connected is by the fact that we want to keep supporting global churches. We want to keep supporting global churches. This is we, one of the ways that is very, well, it's simple, but not simplistic, is the way that fact that you give financially to your church, and that giving impacts people that you don't even know. It's simple to say and difficult to do. I get it. Our church gives to Sovereign Grace, and it's difficult. We have a building that needs some work, and in fact, that 10% that we give on, on an annual basis is tempting when at our building there's a crack in the wall that I can see sunlight through sometimes. But we've made a commitment to set aside those funds, and we've told the church that that's what we're called to do. And the same here for you. Think about how you can give and sacrifice for this church financially. Even if you're not giving, you can start to give small. 
You can start to put your money and then in this place and see how your heart follows. There's a lot of ways in which your giving impacts the world. Here's a few examples of people that, that, are, that are being impacted for the glory of the gospel because of financial giving from the United States and the Philippines. We have Dave Taylor, who's the leader of our, our sister church in Sydney, Australia. He is serving bivocational pastors. We have over 18 churches and many more pastors who are coming together in Manila on a regular basis to learn how to understand and apply scripture so that they might be able to preach. We're delivering invitations in the Philippines. We're delivering invitations in Dubai. The Midwestern region has partnered with a group to serve pastors in a closed Muslim country. I can't tell you what country they are serving in, but twice this year, our pastors have taught 10 pastors from this closed Muslim country. These are pastors who are actively persecuted for their faith. They are, and their people, are persecuted for the fact that they are Christians. And all of these pastors work by, are pastors by night, and they do something else by day. Some of them make bricks. Some of them are in the sanitation department. All of them, all these 10 pastors are responsible for 15 churches minimum each. And they visit them weekly. And that represents 40,000 people. So 10 pastors representing 40,000 people. They come to Dubai. And we seek to train them and help them in how to understand and apply scripture. Here, here's their context. In one church, Christians were martyred for their faith. Radical Hindu opponents to Christianity poisoned the well water so that when the Christians and their family went to get families went to get water, they were poisoned and died. Another pastor was called to watch, his, watch a family burned alive because that family loved Jesus. Even in a place like that, there are more invitations to deliver. Now, as we interact with people there, we might be able to teach them a thing or two about theology but we have more to learn from them about what it means to follow Jesus. Yes. Amen. And even there, invitations are going out. In that country, they're serving people who can't get jobs. There are only two jobs that can be done by Christians in that country because they're too dirty for normal citizens, making bricks like the Egyptians and cleaning porta potties those Christians we will sing with in Revelation chapter 19. Those Christians, <laughs> I hardly feel worthy to put myself in the same category as them. Those Christians, it costs to follow Jesus. Those Christians are building something there in that closed country, just like you are here. They're delivering invitations, and so are you. And as you give financially to the work of this church, a portion makes its way to help those Christians in that part of the world that you will never visit. So how do we deliver these invitations? How are we connected to global missions? How are we connected to evangelism and church planning? Remember, we want to keep local church and missiology connected. We want to keep planting churches. We want to keep supporting global churches. And lastly, we want to keep building this church on the gospel. It's appropriate to begin where we started. This is not just a message for pastors, but it's one for all of us. It's one for all of us. May we not lose our focus on what we're about here. This is about more than a meeting that starts at 10 o'clock when you come together and sing. This is about reminding ourselves that we serve a risen Savior who is building something in this world and impacting people not just for today and tomorrow, but for eternity. How can we focus on what's most important? May we, number one, keep believing the gospel with the urgency that it demands. 
Listen, when you make Sunday morning worship a priority so that you can sing the scriptures, pray the scriptures, sit under the preaching of the scriptures, and fellowship around the scriptures, you are intertwining your life with Jesus and his purpose. And that matters. When you build your life on the gospel, when you build your life on the, in this church on the message of the gospel, this will now become even more of a place others will want to come. I want this kind of experience that you know replicated the world over in all kinds of different languages, in all kinds of different places, in all kinds of different states in our union and countries in other parts of the world. We are doomed in our evangelism and mission if we do not have strong local churches. Keep placing your hope in Christ. Also pray. Pray. You might think praying doesn't do much, but it's just because we can't see the effects. We want to pray that the lost would be found. We want to pray for the opportunity to share with others. We want to pray for boldness to tell. We want to pray for other churches to be strong and church plants to start. We want to pray for nations and people groups. We want to pray for people in our community and our kids at their, our kids' school. We want to pray for our family. We want to pray in secret. We want to pray in small group and pray in public and pray on Sunday. We want to pass out invitations because some people are going to say yes. And they're going to come alongside the rest of us and cry out with one voice in Revelation chapter 19, Hallelujah. For the Lord, our God, the Almighty, reigns. There will be some who say, yeah, I want in. Pray for those. Pray. We want to keep building our church on the gospel, meaning that we want to believe the gospel with the urgency it demands. It demands. We want to pray. We want to continue to be a church that cares. And this takes time. Most of us, most people, even Christians, are hardwired to care mostly about ourselves. It takes time to build a church that cares about people they will never meet. Many of the worthwhile endeavors are interested in it. We're not, just, we're not just trying to build feel-good stories, but fruit. And it takes time for fruit to grow and a harvest to be reaped. Continue to be a kind of church that cares about gospel fruit and eternal matters. And lastly, continue to be, to be the kind of church that sends. That sends across he sends a plate of cookies across your street. Sends a smile to someone who is down and out. Maybe sends a team across the state or the city or the world. Because there are many invitations to deliver. There are many people to reach. And because you are connected together and connected to Jesus, because of that, you are connected to what we're doing in Sovereign Grace. And one day, one day we will all be together. All the church plants and missionaries, all the people from around the globe will gather together with one voice. There will be no more sending out. There's coming a day where there will be no more sending out only a gathering in. There's coming a day where there will be no more sacrifice, where there will be no more of praying to raise people up. There's coming a day where everyone from every age and every country and every language will come together with one voice and shout, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are invited, and there are others yet to invite.
Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we are grateful that we can look forward into the future and see our future and see where we will be. And Lord, I ask for your blessing upon Redemption Hill Church. Lord, you've done so much already in just five years, Lord. I come and I see all the work that you've done. The work that is going on here is a work that could not be done only with human hands. A work, the work here is work that you have done, Lord, and I celebrate that. And I pray, Lord, for strength. Lord, I pray for unity in this church, both today and long term. I pray that that unity would build a strength, and I pray that that strength would be a, a strong foundation for this church for the years to come. Lord, we pray that strength would translate into raising up men and women to send around the state and around the world to plant churches. I pray that that strength would be a place where people who are lost and, and blind and dead in their transgressions and sins, may this be a place that they can come and see and live and yes. know you. Lord, I pray that you would put a passion and a desire for the unbelievers in the hearts of every person in this room. I pray for opportunity for each and every person to be able to connect with someone who's not a believer and share the gospel with them and share life with them. Lord, I pray that you would give opportunity to Redemption Hill Church. I would pray that you would, you would take this spark of this, this, the reality of the love that they have for you, Lord, and I pray that you would fan that into flame, and I pray that that flame would spread. Lord, I pray for an impact in Round Rock and beyond because of the work you do here amongst these wonderful people. Thank you for these people, Lord. Thank you for the fact that you touched them and you have changed them, and one day you will call them home. Thank you that they are committed to passing out invitations. And Lord, I pray that you would raise someone up so that they might experience what it is to send away people that they wouldn't ever imagine sending away for the good of your gospel so that invitations might go out. I just pray a blessing on this church in now and into the future. Lord, that you would make this church fruitful yes. in every possible way. I pray that this church and this culture would be replicated in other places, amongst other people, even in other languages. And so, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would do this. Lord, I, we are confident because you can do far more than we can ask or imagine. And it's in your name that we pray.